able to meet Dr. Lieberdor. It's going to be some fantastic science. I'm just going to give people a few more minutes to sort of file in, get settled, get comfortable, start getting ready to learn some chemistry. Just a little bit. Exactly. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for Hi, coming. Hi, welcome. <laughs> welcome, thank you so much for coming. My name is Ali and I am a bookseller in the children and teens department. And unfortunately, like you, I've actually been trapped inside the bookstore by an evil scientist, Dr. Hans Dragas. And I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Kate Bieberdorf who can help us out of this tricky situation. As a scientist and entertainer, Dr. Bieberdorf is passionate about reaching students of all skill levels with a theatrical and hands-on approach. She has a doctorate in chemistry from UT Austin, where she currently teaches, and her newest book, Kate the Chemist, The Great Escape, is part of a series, and it follows a group of classmates as they use chemistry to solve a science-themed escape room. Uh, you can click the link we will drop in the chat to get your own copy of her newest book, Kate the Chemist, uh, The Great Escape. And if you have a question for Dr. Bieberdorf, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. At the end of the chat, she will have time to answer some of your questions. And you can also vote on questions you want answered. Please remember that this is a safe space for everyone, so make sure to keep your questions and comments respectful. During your activity today, questions will pop up on your screen at different points. And when you answer them, please be sure to click Submit, otherwise they won't go through. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, over to you, Dr. Bieberdorf. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I am so excited to be here. Um, special shout out to Politics and Prose Bookstore. I really appreciate y'all hosting me. Um, I'm just absolutely just thrilled to be doing a virtual escape room for you all. So thank you very much for coming and for having me. Let's get started. Um, but actually, oh geez, I get so excited. Before I do that, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, like she said, my name is Dr. Kate Bieberdorf, but you may know me as Kate the Chemist. I am a chemistry professor, so I teach at the University of Texas. I teach general chemistry, and I have 900 students this semester, 900. Um, we're doing everything virtually this year, so I talk through a camera, and they speak back to me. Um, it's a little challenging, but we're making it work, just like every single teacher across the country is. I'm also a science entertainer, so what I do is I travel across the country, um, well, usually, under usual terms, I travel across the country, and I blow stuff up, and I try to show everyone how amazing and fun science is. Um, and one of my main goals is to try to just show a different version of a scientist. Like it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, anybody can be a scientist. And now most recently, um, what I've started doing is writing books. And so I've become an author. And so in May, I came out with the Big Book of Experiments, which is 25 experiments that you can do at home using materials that you probably already have in your kitchen and in your pantry. Um, and with that, I came out with the first Kate the Chemist fiction book. And so this was Dragons versus Unicorns. And this is when I first got to introduce my little alter ego, um, Kate the Chemist. And she's a 10 year old girl, so fifth grader. And she goes around her neighborhood and uses science to solve her everyday neighborhood problems. So she experiences everything that regular fifth graders experience. And she just tries to use science to kind of solve and solve the problem and get through her day. So in the first book, she was part of their school play called Dragons versus Unicorns. Um, and a couple different hiccups happened. And again, she tried to use science, chemistry in particular, to try to get through and save the day. Um, I'm not gonna ruin it for you because I don't wanna give it away. But I do wanna point out that every single one of these books in the fiction series uh, is a mystery. And at the very back of the book, I include an at-home experiment for you. So you can actually do one of the science experiments that you read about in there. So for this first one, I have unicorn glue, which is super fun. But then just recently, I came out with my new book called The Great Escape. And so The Great Escape is about little Kate the Chemist again with her gang. And they actually get in trouble in the science lab. So they're up to no good. They kind of make some mistakes. And as a, I don't want to say a punishment, but as a solution to the situation, their chemistry teacher basically asks them 
to compete in this escape room and it's all science themed all chemistry themed and i don't want to give any more away because i think you should be able to enjoy it yourself um you get to solve all the puzzles along with kate and her crew so i just like i said i don't want to say too much about it because i really want you to be able to experience it and i know how much fun solving puzzles is especially when you can put them all together to solve one really big puzzle um so that's all i'm going to say about that i will say that in the great escape the experiment included is called magnetic magnetic slime. So at the very end of this today, I'm going to show you how to make magnetic slime and I'll tell you or kind of show you how it works so that you can do this at home. All right, I think enough of that, right? Let's go ahead and get started with this. What I'm going to do, because I can't tell you too much about The Great Escape without giving away the plot, I'm going to have you all go through your own virtual escape room. So now the escape room is set up. I'll kind of talk you through the whole presentation. It's a PowerPoint presentation. There's a bunch of little stories in there. Um, there are three big puzzles that you're going to have to solve. So if you're working with classmates, make sure you work together, talk to talk each one out. Um, and then after a little bit of thinking, we're going to throw polls up there and you'll be able to respond and vote and we'll see if you can figure it out. Heads up, I'm going to tell you right now, some of the clues are really extra tricky, so don't get frustrated at all if you can't get it done in this short time span. If you had more time, I'm sure you'd be able to solve it, so don't get frustrated. We are just here to have some fun and also learn a little bit of science on the way. All right, without a further ado, I just butchered that, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you guys can see this. If not, I'm sure someone will jump in and let me know that it's not working properly. Um, but here is our escape room. So it is officially called the Great Escape Escape Room. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, here we go. The setup. Oh no, you have been trapped inside of the Politics and Prose bookstore by an evil scientist named Dr. Hans Dragus. He wants to set off an explosion in the parking lot that could potentially destroy the entire city. Luckily for us, when Dr. Dragus was rushing out of the bookstore, he dropped a few clues that we can use to open the combination lock on the front door. If we work together to solve a few puzzles, we will be able to get out of the store in time to stop the evil Dr. Dragus. Your first clue. So first things first, you all need a copy of the periodic table that Dr. Dragus dropped when he was running out the door. So if we were in person, I would hand this periodic table out to you, but since we're not, we're going to get creative. Um, so I will be popping the periodic table on top of the slide so that you always have a visual for it. But for those of you that have maybe another monitor or something nearby where you're around and there's more than one person, you could also pop up ptable.com. It is my favorite electronic periodic table. Um, I'm sure you all have a favorite periodic table, but my favorite one is ptable.com. Um, so you could go there and that will help you solve the clues. You will need the information on this table every single time you solve the puzzles. Okay. All right. So now <clears throat> This must be our first clue. So you have a few minutes to see if you can determine the one word code from the periodic table. So I'm going to give you like 30 seconds to think about it first because I don't want to show the clue yet or the options yet because I don't want to give it away. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about it. Then we're going to pop up the poll and then we can vote on the answer. Okay, so 30 seconds starts now. Go try to solve the clue. This is the hardest part for me because I want to help you. Fifteen seconds left. You're looking for a one word clue. So we're going to go ahead and put the poll up in three, two, and one. Here is your first clue and there's your poll. What is the one word clue left by Dr. Dragus? Go ahead and start voting everyone. Start voting. All right, hopefully we're getting some submissions. Five more seconds to get your answer in. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, and close the poll. And now can we please share the results? 
it looks like we have 105% voted for flask. That's wonderful. I don't know how we did that, but wonderful. <laughs> So we all were able to figure that out. Great job, everyone. So we put together our F for flooring, then we have L, A, S, N, K. We put them all together to give us flask. Nice job, you all. All right. So this is what a flask looks like. Um, this one specifically is called an Erlenmeyer flask. And an Erlenmeyer flask is wide at the bottom and then narrow at the top. And so in theory, in the uh, escape room, we would be looking for a flask that looks something like this. Um, before I get any further into the escape room, I want to give you just a little bit more information about the periodic table because I think you are going to need it in the future. Okay, so this is the periodic table. It is the best table in the entire world. I'm obviously biased. And all the information that a chemist needs is sitting right here in this wonderful table. So for example, every single element that we know about right now here in 2020 has its own box on the periodic table. So right now we know about 118 elements. So there are 118 boxes here on our periodic table. The letters are abbreviations called chemical symbols. So if you look up here in the upper left hand corner, you can see the capital H. The H is an abbreviation for hydrogen. Below it, we can see Li for lithium, then Be for beryllium, then sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, and so on and so forth. But you're not here to hear me talk about that. So let's jump on and move on to the next one. And you will also see that inside every box, in, in, uh, in addition to the chemical abbreviation and the chemical symbol, you will also see that there are two types of numbers that are commonly found in the periodic table. So you're going to see a bigger number size-wise that's in the upper left-hand corner. And then you see a smaller number font size, but bigger number numerically right underneath the chemical symbol. So that's underneath. But because that's a little confusing, let's take a little bit of a deeper look at that. So let's look at an example. Um, I chose to look at fluorine. I like fluorine. I think it's a really nice one. Plus, I think it has a really cool abbreviation with a capital F here. So the chemical symbol is the letter that is in the middle of the box. So we have a capital F, and that stands for fluorine. The atomic number is located in the top left corner. That tells us how many protons that that specific atom has. So fluorine has nine protons. The atomic mass is located directly below the chemical symbol. And so that one, that number specifically, is just the mass of an atom. So there's three different uh, things here in your box. Two of them are numbers. Now, here is your first hint of the escape room. So there's four hints total. This is your first one. So your first hint is you will need to use the atomic mass when you solve each of the following clues. The atomic mass is the number directly below the chemical symbol. All right, so back to the escape room. Now that we have enough chemistry knowledge, let's jump forward. So if you remember, the first clue was the periodic table. There were a couple different elements outlined with the black squares. We shuffled that all together and we found out that our first clue led us to a flask. Okay, that's the word flask. Now we have to deal with it. So here we're back in the escape room and let's search for a flask. So after looking around the bookstore for a few minutes, you find a plastic flask. Inside the flask, there are three test tubes filled with differently colored liquids and a note. You look a little closer at the test tubes. One test tube contains a clear liquid that has lots of bubbles. Another test tube has a slightly yellowish liquid. The last two test tube contains a thick blue liquid that smells an awfully lot like dish soap. What does the note say? Caution. Do not mix the chemicals together in the wrong order. <gasps> Ooh, what do you think the note means? It looks like we need to mix the three liquids together in the flask, but what order do we use? So there does not seem to be any more writing on the test tubes or the flask itself. So you examine the note a little more closely. What is on the other side of the note? When you flip it over, you see a secret code written lightly in pencil. This must be our next clue. So you have a few minutes to see if you can determine what order we need to add the liquids to the flask. So let me get your periodic table over here. 
And let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you guys. So you have 30 seconds right now just to think. Okay, read the clue again here and then look at the periodic table and then use this clue over here on your left. 30 seconds just to think and see if you can kind of take a crack at this. Then we'll pull up the poll again because we don't want to give away anything ahead of time. So go ahead, 30 seconds starts now. You can do this, I promise you can do this. Think it through. All right, about 15 more seconds here. And we'll put up the poll in about five, four, three, two, and one. So here is our second poll. What is the correct order that we need to add the liquids to the flask? So I can give you the table back again. I don't know where the best place to put it. We'll put it like that. Ah, I lost it. I lost it. <laughs> All right, go ahead and start voting, you guys. Go ahead. I'll give you a full minute here because I don't want to rush you and I want you to be able to have an opportunity to solve this. So full minute. Go ahead. What is your vote? Oh, I wish I was with you guys right now. It would be so nice. About 30 more seconds here. I want to make sure you have enough time. You know, there's a bit of a delay with virtual things here. Hopefully you can see that. All right, I think we're getting pretty close here. So five, four, three, two, and one. Let's end the poll. Could we share the results, please? Ooh, lots of different results here. Okay, so we see 80% of people picked B, 24% of people picked a, we have unique numbers happening here. Okay, this is interesting. Um, lovely, so a lot of different votes. You wanna see what the correct answer is? Drum roll, please. B, the correct answer is B. It is clear and then blue and then yellow. So nice job, you guys. If you didn't get that, do not worry. Um, the periodic table was pretty small, so I do not, I'm not surprised at all if you weren't able to see it, but hopefully you were able to. Um, but let's talk through how we could approach and get to that answer. Um, so these numbers on our note, on our clue, this yellow clue, can be found on the periodic table. So 1.08, the 6.941, 4.003 can all be found on the periodic table. So the first element, hydrogen, has the atomic mass of 1.008 grams per mole. The second element, helium, has an atomic mass of 4.003. And our third element, lithium, has an atomic mass of 6.941. So if we put these in, in order of one, two, and three, we can rank them by size there. We can see that our overall order would then be clear, blue, and then yellow. Congratulations, everyone. Um, so let's do the experiment. Now, unfortunately, I am not there and I can't do the experiment for you, but I can play a video for you where I can show you what this would look like. So in our Erlenmeyer flask, remember Erlenmeyer flask, so it's wide at the bottom and then narrow at the top. In our flask, we have a couple things already. So both of these, for both of them, the one is red and one is blue, um, both of them contain 35% hydrogen peroxide. So that has two H atoms and two oxygen atoms, two hydrogens, two oxygens. Then we also have dish soap. Um, it doesn't really matter what dish soap you use, but it just wants, you just wanna use something that has a high surfactant there because you want a lot of bubbles for this experiment. Um, and then obviously we had to add some food coloring. So I added like a bucket of red food coloring there and a lot of blue. I think we used a whole bottle, maybe even two bottles if my memory serves correctly. So we dumped all that in, swoosh it around. And now you can see both of us are about to add the catalyst. So this catalyst is called potassium iodide. And let's see if we can get this to play. 
Wonderful. So we dump that in. And then, woo -hoo -hoo! yay! You can see it's still going there on both of them. They're continuing to go and just keep reacting there. Obviously, I'm a little nerdy and excited. Um, I was very happy about the experiment. Let me see if I can get this out of here there. So that is called, well, let me hear. I don't want to give it away here, but we do the experiment. So um, let's go through here with the slides. Come on, there we go. So we slowly add the liquids from the test tubes to the flask. So keep this in the back of your mind so you can picture what's happening here in our bookstore, in our escape room. The clear liquid is added first and nothing happened. Then we add the blue liquid and again, nothing happened. So this is where we started to turn the video on, right? All those liquids had already been added. Then we add the yellow liquid, that's what we added in, and the entire mixture shoots 10 feet into the air, spitting out a yellow foam everywhere. It is called elephant's toothpaste. So one of your friends recognizes this experiment as a classic chemistry demo called elephant's toothpaste. Thinking this must be another hint, you all search the bookstore for more clues. After a few minutes, someone notices a huge stuffed animal in the corner of the room. They pick up the elephant to see that it was sitting on an envelope. Before they can even open the envelope, someone on the other side of the room finds a tube of toothpaste. This tube is blue and it has a giant picture of Superman on it. Everyone runs back to the center of the room with their clues so that they can open the envelope together. It's another note! The only way you will get out in time is if you use the planet in our galaxy with the shortest year. Too bad Superman is stuck on planet Krypton. Oh, oh no. This must be our last clue. Okay, so I'll admit this is the trickiest one. I, I'm just gonna say that right, there, right now, but you can do this. Okay, you can figure this out. We have a couple hints here to get you through this. So you have a few minutes to see if you can determine the four digit code needed to open the combination lock on the front door. So I'm gonna give you 30 seconds just to process this clue, read it over again, think about what it means. Then I'm going to give you your second, third and fourth hint, okay? So go ahead and read for 30 seconds, I'll be quiet. All right, so the only way you will get out in time is if you use the planet in our galaxy with the shortest year. Too bad Superman is stuck on planet Krypton. Okay, so hint number two. You will need to use the atomic masses for two elements from the periodic table. Both elements are also planets. So remember, we are looking for the four digit code that will open the combination lock on the front door. Okay. The only way you will get out in time is if you use the planet in our galaxy with the shortest year. Too bad Superman is stuck on planet Krypton. Okay, so one more hint here. Here is a map of our solar system. Okay, you will need to use something from here and from our periodic table. So one second here to pull that back up. I'm gonna put this over here. So you have 30 seconds now. See if you can put this together. <laughs> I'll shrink it up a little bit. Okay, see if you can put this together. We're looking to see um, two elements from the periodic table and use your clue right here plus the map. So 30 seconds here, then I'll come in and give you your third hint. Go ahead. I really think I need Jeopardy music during this. Don't you guys think? I could sing for you, but I don't want to torture you. <laughs> I'll just stick to being a scientist. <laughs> All right, so hint number three. So the first part here, the only way you will get out in time is if you use the planet in our galaxy with the shortest year. So that means we are looking for the planet that is closest to the sun 
because that means it has the shortest distance to travel in one loop, right? So it has the shortest distance to travel and that's how we define one year. And so if we look at all of our planets in our solar system, here we see is that Mercury is the one that is closest to our sun, our big star, right? So we have Mercury very, very close to it. Well, it turns out that Mercury is also an element on the periodic table. And so hint number three is that you are going to need this information right there. That's mercury. Mercury has the chemical abbreviation of HG. So you will need some kind of information from that square to solve your clue. Now, remember, you're looking for a four digit code. And now you need to look at the second part. What can the second part tell you? 30 seconds, then I'll jump back in and give you your last hint of the escape room. Go ahead, guys. All right, let's look at that second part of our clue now. So down here we see too bad Superman is stuck on planet Krypton. So as a chemist, as soon as I hear the word Krypton, my ears peak up, we perk up because I also know that Krypton is an element on the periodic table. So Krypton KR right here is the second clue. So now what I'm going to do is substitute out my periodic tables here and give you this big one. And now you have one final minute here. So you're in your last minute, what I want you to do is see how you can combine these two Two. Okay, somehow with these two, remember we're coming up with a four digit code, okay, a four digit code um, that is going to open our combination lock to stop the evil Dr. Dragus. So you have one last minute here, we're going to put the poll up in about 30 seconds. Okay, so go ahead, see if you can do this, which you can actually, you can do this. Don't know why this bar is here. I don't know if you guys are seeing that, but I apologize. I'm trying to get it to leave. Don't know why. All right. I think we could put the poll up pretty soon. I think we're ready for that. So let's go ahead and jump right into the last one. What is the last clue? What is the four digit code needed to open the combination lock on the front door of the bookstore? Okay, what is the correct one? What do we think, guys? I've been voting too, so I'm probably the one throwing the percentages off, but I can't help it. I wanna vote. <laughs> All right, guys, about 20 more seconds here, and then we'll see if we can save the day, if we can get out of the bookstore. Although, why would we ever want to leave a bookstore, to be perfectly honest, right? All right, we're going to close our last poll. Make sure you get your vote in in five, four, three, two, and one. Stopping our poll. Let's see our results. What do we think, you guys? Ooh, we're pretty split. Almost 50-50. Half of us think A, half of us think B. I love it. I love it. Let's see. The correct answer is A, two, eight, four, four. Let's talk through that because like I said, this one was the trickiest one. There were a lot of different pieces to this puzzle. So let's kind of walk through how we get there. So the first part of our clue reads, the only way you will get out in time is if you use the planet in our galaxy with the shortest year. So Mercury has the shortest year in our galaxy. Mercury with the symbol HG is also an element on the periodic table with the atomic mass 200.59 grams per mole. Now the second part of the clue says too bad Superman is stuck on planet Krypton. Well, Superman is from planet Krypton. Krypton symbol KR is also an element on the periodic table with the atomic mass 83.8 grams per mole. So what we needed to do, and this is the part that was really the, like, the, the little extra piece that we had to do, is we had to take the atomic mass of 
each element from mercury and krypton, add them together to get our four digit code. So when you add 200 to your 83.8, we end up with 284.4. So our code at the end of the day is 2844. A was the correct answer. Let's see how this escape room ends. So you all run to the front door and enter 2844 into the combination lock. It works. The lock opens and everyone rushes out of the bookstore just in time to say, stop the evil Dr. Dragus. Congratulations! Yay! <laughs> so thank you guys so much for participating in my, albeit a little goofy escape room with uh, some chemistry thrown in there. I really appreciate it. What I'm going to do now is actually I'm going to stop sharing my screen and now I want to show you the magnetic slime that Kate and her gang need to use in order to solve something. And that's all I'm going to say because I don't want to give anything away. But I will tell you the magnetic slime is important. So how do you make magnetic slime? And actually, before I do anything, I promised my husband I would put a towel over my laptop so I don't ruin another computer. So what we have is magnetic slime. Oh, it's amazing. I might even turn my virtual background off for this, y'all, so that you can see it for real. Give me one second here. No judgment for my blank black white walls. Very boring. Okay, here we go. So what we have to do to make magnetic slime is you start off with quality glue. Okay, so you definitely want to use something like Elmer's. You don't want to use any dollar store uh, glue when you're making slime. The reason being is quality glue has a molecule called polyvinyl acetate in it. And it's this wonderful molecule that polymerizes with borate whenever it can. So then what we need to do to make slime is give it its borate or a source of boron. And so the best way to do that is to use contact solution or saline solution. So when I make my slime, I use two parts glue to one part contact solution. So for example, this guy right here was made with two cups of Elmer's glue and one cup of saline solution. But as you can see, it's black, right? So I don't know if your slime is usually black, but mine is black today. And I didn't do that with just adding all the colors for my food coloring. Um, instead, what I did is I took my glue and then before I added the contact solution, I added something called iron oxide powder. And so iron oxide powder is a powder that's magnetic at room temperature. And so what happens is I um, mix up my glue, my quality glue with my iron oxide powder, and then I added my saline solution. So I added all three of these pieces together, and then I let this sit for a very long time. I actually made this this morning for you guys. I got up really early and made it because I noticed that the longer that you let your species sit in the saline solution, the better slime you get. So this is more of like a silly putty. Do you notice instead of a slime, like it's not liquidy, it's sticking together. And so the reason being is that the glue polyvinyl acetate and the borate polymerize, which is just a big word for meaning they make a huge molecule. And so they come together and they make this giant molecule that's like a snake kind of, it's just really, really long. Um, or maybe you could think about it for a connection of Legos if you put them all together in a long stripe. So you get this big polymer, but then like I said, you add the iron oxide powder and the iron oxide powder is magnetic. And so you get to make your slime magnetic. So are you ready for this part? What you need is a powerful magnet. So I usually use neodymium magnets and you can see mine are dirty because I can't help myself. I play with this all the time. And so what I'm gonna try to show you here we shall see if it'll cooperate, is that the slime will defy gravity. Do you see? Oh, did you see that? So it's moving up. And so the slime is actually climbing up, defying gravity. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And so what's really neat is, okay, because I can only do this once, so I'm going to do this right now, so pay attention here. I'm going to let the slime eat the magnet. So I'm going to just put it there and watch what happens. It eats it. Isn't that cool? And so the iron oxide powder, the iron in there specifically is magnetic. And so it's attracted to the magnetic field in half of these magnets. And so it just gets sucked right in there. And now my magnet is completely gone. 
Do you see that? It was eaten by the slime, which I think is amazing. So if you want to know more information about that or more details about it, you could check out my book in The Great Escape because the experiment is in the back there. Um, but it's also in the big book of experiments. And I have 24 more experiments just like that. And they're super, super fun to try to show you how amazing chemistry and science is. So that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll be sticking around for quite a while to answer some questions. So if you have any questions, please take advantage of the Q&A. Uh, you can upvote questions that you like. If you think there's a good question and you want me to answer it, make sure you upvote that. And then my girl Ellie here is going to help me field these questions so that we can make sure we get everyone's question answered to the best of our ability, obviously. <laughs> Heck yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Bieberdorf. That was an incredible experiment. I love that slime. That's, I was gasping and screaming. Uh, also, thanks to all of you for rescuing us from the bookstore. That was amazing work uh, and very exciting. Incredible chemistry. Uh, so I think now it is time for me to go through the questions here and ask some of them. Uh, the first one we have here is from Katie G. It says, when did you decide you wanted to be a chemist? Ooh, hi, Katie. Great question. Um, that's, it's actually pretty easy. I don't know. I go back and forth on this question because I, I knew I liked chemistry when I was taking it from my sophomore high school teacher. So Mrs. Kelly Palsrock, um, she was just so energetic. She loved teaching chemistry. She would run around the classroom and she was just so happy to be there, or at least she acted like that. And I just, I loved being in her classroom and she made chemistry come alive for me. So I would say ever since I was 15 years old, I knew I wanted to be a chemist, um, but I didn't know I wanted to teach until I got a little bit older and started tutoring and getting out into classrooms and engaging with kids. Um, that took quite a while. I wanted to, I kind of fell in love with that when I was in graduate school. Good question. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, another question we have here. This is from Kamari S. Have you ever broken a world record before? Oh, good question. So Mari, I've actually tried once. So I tried to break the Guinness World Record for the largest chemistry lecture. Um, and we were all set up to do it. We were going to squash the record, like double it. And the week, the week, before we went and we had this whole event planned, they published another one. So someone somewhere out, like nowhere near us, beat the record. They beat it by the capacity over our capacity in our room. So we couldn't even beat it. Cause like, I can't remember what it was. I'm just gonna have to make up these numbers, but it was like, they had 1600 people in our lecture hall only fit 1500 people. So we couldn't even beat it if we, if we wanted to. So it was absolutely devastating because we had put so much work into it. We were so convinced we were going to get the record, but I kind of had forgotten about that. So oh, I think I'm going to have to go for it again. It's been long enough. I mean, it's been a year and a half or so. So I think it's time for it to go for it again. So maybe I'll have to do that. Thank you for the encouragement. I don't know if you meant to do that, but that's what I got out of that. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. I mean, <clears throat> I love that for you. <laughs> Thank you, Kamari. Thank you. <laughs> why asks, why do you write your books? What inspires you? Oh, great question. Um, I, did you say Dustin? Yes. Yafet? Oh, Yafet. Oh, Yafet. Sorry. I thought you said Dustin. Oh, Not even okay. close. Yafet. Hi. Nice to meet you. Great question. Um, my inspiration for my books, honestly, I have kind of two inspirations. So when I was a kid, I wanted this version of this book. Oh, and of course, there we go. Um, the experiment book. Like I wanted something where I could get my hands dirty. I wanted to be building experiments, taking things apart, putting them back together. Like this is what I wanted to do when I was a kid. But my sister, not so much. Like she was, she was still scientific and still inquiry based and asking all these questions, but she wasn't as much of a doer. She was more of a reader, right? And so what I wanted to do was write an accompanying series or a companion series to kind of hook other students that might not necessarily love science. Maybe they kind of like it a little bit, but they're not sure about it. And so I wanted to write a fiction series that kind of just just lightly brings the science in. And so you're, you're experiencing it, you see it, you see the cool side of science um, without it being like forced down your throat in a science class. And so for me, I just wanted it to be fun. I wanted you to see why chemistry could be fun even for a fifth grader. So that's why I wrote those books and I like them. I love doing them and I hope I can keep writing them forever. So. <laughs> Thank you, that's fantastic. Another question we have from Alicia B. 
is how do you do the fire breathing experiment? Oh, okay. So if I was doing this and giving this lecture to a bunch of adults, I would tell you. Um, but because we have some students in the audience, here's what I will say. Um, you put something in your mouth and it's a powder, it's a solid, and that solid contains a lot of carbon. And so when I spit that solid over a blowtorch, the entire carbon, all those carbon atoms, they try to ignite, they kind of, they combust, that's the right word. And so they turn, um, they convert their system uh, and have a combustion reaction. And so the molecules convert into carbon dioxide and water. And so it's a really neat reaction, but it's something that's dangerous. And I had to be really careful about when I was learning how to do it. Um, so I always make sure I have my blue lab coat on. So my blue lab coat, I don't know if you've noticed, is different from a traditional white lab coat. I wear the blue ones because the blue ones are flame retardant and so they're resistant to fire. And since I breathe fire and I light my hand on fire and I play with fire all the time, I have to be safe about it. And obviously if I was gonna breathe fire, I would not have my hair down. I would not have hairspray in my hair, which is extraordinarily flammable. Um, so I would be in a completely different outfit if I was going to do anything with fire today. Makes sense. That's awesome. Uh, Zoe C asks, what do you like to read? Ooh, great question. So I go between like three kind of different genres. So I love to read nonfiction books about science. Probably not surprised. Um, I just reread Physics for Future Presidents. Um, I love that book. I think it's wonderful. Um, and so I was just telling <laughs> these girls here before we jumped on here that I'm looking for a new book. I'm between books. So I'm, I'm kind of desperately seeking for one because I like two different other types of stories. I like ones that are really lighthearted reads like Sophie Kinsella books. I just love what she says. She's just a goofy with that British humor. I just love it. Um, but then I also like sci-fi books. I like things like magic. Um, I loved the Game of Thrones series. If we could get another book there, I would be super excited. Um, but like everyone else who loved that series, we've been waiting um, patiently for the next book. So I would say I like things about magic which seems kind of silly because I know that I go around and run around screaming in, in the everyday life that, you know, magic is really just science. It's all just science experiments, not magic tricks. But I've got to admit that when I go to, you know, my space and I'm just reading, I love witches and warlocks and trolls and dragons and anything like that. It's just so entertaining to me. <laughs> that is awesome. I love those sorts of books also. Alexis asks, what started your career to write books? Great question, Alexis. Also, I have to point out that you have a fabulous name. My middle name is Alexis. So I just want to say hi. We're basically best friends now. Okay, good. So now Alexis, um, what started my career to write books? Honestly, I've, I've always wanted to. I've wanted to do the, the experiment book was an easy write for me because I've wanted to put this together. I've been traveling across the country for years doing experiments for kids. And every single time I get the question like, you know, where can I get more of this? How do I do this? And so it started off as like a literally a word document that I was sending out to people and saying, do this and this and this. And then it slowly morphed into what this is now. And let me see if I can find a picture for you guys. Um, but basically it's a step-by-step -step thing. And then I have pictures of everything. So you can kind of see step-by-step -step exactly what you're supposed to do. Cause sometimes with experiment books, it's a little confusing. Like, what do you mean heat until it gets to X? And so I have a picture of everything, every single step. So you know exactly what you're supposed to be doing um, so that you can get the expected results. But because it, we're scientists, I really want you to investigate and explore. So at the end of every experiment, I have two or three or four questions that ask you to take it a step further. Like what happens if you do X? Can you add Y to this? because I want you to keep exploring and obviously every question I ask is still safe. I would never ask you to do something crazy or unsafe. Awesome, thank you. And a question from, sorry, my screen's being weird. A question from Rebecca is, what is your favorite science experiment? Ooh, Rebecca, great question. That's hard. I, it's hard. It really depends on the day and like what's going on in my life. Something, sometimes I want something more dramatic, something I want, sometimes I want something more fundamental for the chemistry principle. I will tell you that there's one I really miss. 
Um, and so I haven't been able to do this one since March because of the pandemic, everything shut down and it's been very difficult for me to get my hands on liquid nitrogen. And so I am really missing my thundercloud experiment. I used to do that like at least once a week, maybe not, maybe even more. And I just, I haven't done it in months. And this experiment is something where you take a bucket of hot water in your hands and you throw it into a bucket of liquid nitrogen. And on my good days, I can create a, a huge white cloud that goes three stories in the air and it's it's amazing and it's cold it's like chilly feeling it goes all over you my entire body disappears it's just it's such a fun experiment it's big and it's visual and it's amazing and i miss it like i really genuinely miss it i wish i could do that one and so i'm hoping things can move forward a little bit quickly so i can get back into the lab <laughs> that sounds so incredible i wish i could see that in person Hopefully someday. Someday. I'll come over there and do it right in the middle of the bookstore. No problem. Heck yes. Absolutely. <laughs> we don't need a roof. No. No. <laughs> Ooh, a question from Anne is, what was your favorite thing to do during your childhood? Ooh, Anne, great question. Probably, if I had to say one thing, it would have been soccer. Loved soccer. I played soccer just all the time, all the way through through high school. Um, I was okay. I was I was okay. I made the Olympic development team. Um, so I loved, loved, loved playing soccer. But then I decided that I wanted to pursue chemistry, and so I didn't do anything in college, which is kind of silly looking back at it. Um, I played intramural soccer, but I just I loved soccer. I always loved playing soccer, and so if you had if I had to do one thing, it would have been that. Surprisingly, not science, right? <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, Thomas S. asks, how do you get the ideas for your characters? A lot of my characters are based off of people that I love and cherish and value in my life. So the science teacher in my, or the science club teacher, I should say, in my books, Miss Daly is based off of my favorite teacher, my chemistry teacher, Mrs. Pals Rock. Um, so a lot of her spunk and pizzazz is based off of her. Um, my little brother in the book, Liam, he is actually kind of an amalgamation, like a big smash together of my little sister and my older brother. So I've kind of forced them, taken the good and the bad of each one of them and made this kind of crazy dynamic character that I love. Um, so a lot of them are based off of people that I grew up with. So in the fourth book, I just finished that manuscript and submitted that one. Um, actually, we're way past that, but <laughs> it's based off of um, one of my beloved friends that I had growing up forever. So my her name was Talat and I loved her. I haven't even told her this, so I hope she's not watching this because it would give it away. Um, but I, I loved her growing up. We were really close friends. And so I based this new character off her called her Tala. Um, and you just kind of for me, it's people that I love. So there's flares of it. Obviously, I had to take some creativity and spin some things around and get them into trouble just because I have that love of it. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Uh, Sheena asks, what is the first experiment you have ever done? The first one? Yeah. Oh, ask, oh. ask for a student, Josie. Um, Josie, great question. I honestly don't know what the first experiment I ever did was. I do know that when I was a kid, um, my mom was incredible and she would, she took this one bathroom and cleared it of anything dangerous. So there were no like hazardous cleaning chemicals or anything like that in there. And it was just like shampoo and bubble bath stuff. Um, and she cleared that room and she essentially gave us this giant green bowl and we would play scientists and we would just dump everything in there and see what kind of nasty concoctions we could come up with the toothpaste and bubble bath and all that fun stuff. Um, so we were playing scientists without even knowing that we were doing that. And so I have such beloved memories playing scientists. There, there was one time with Vicks Vapor Rub, I remember, and that was so cool because we couldn't figure out what was going on there. So I, I think, I guess that would probably be the first science experiment. But honestly, as a scientist and just a human being, if you have a question, you're, you're being a scientist. All, all scientists do are we ask questions and then we try to answer them. We find more data, we research, we, we just talk to our friends and we see if we can come up with an answer that makes sense based on our numbers and our data. I love that. That's so fantastic. Uh, Caitlin asks, how do you get your magnet out of the slime? Oh, geez, I can show you. <gasps> It's, it's just like a mess. I'll say, I'll have to work on it here while we're talking while you can answer, ask another question. Perfect. But it's like, you have to like push it. 
it's just a mess. You have to kind of like pull it out. And if you drop it all, it comes back. Like, see how hard it is? Okay, got most of it off. And then like these other pieces are quite durable. So not too bad, but it's actually a wrestle. And I usually don't do it on camera because I don't look very good going, Rah! I'm like trying to pull the gear of the magnet out. Um, but it's not too hard. I mean, I got it out, right? But it's just not exactly camera friendly. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. Olivia awesome. asks, do you have a favorite element? Yes, of course. Oh my goodness. Every chemist has a favorite element. And if they don't have one, something is suspicious. Um, <laughs> my favorite one is definitely palladium. I use palladium in undergraduate and in graduate school. It's a really good catalyst and it helped me um, do all of my research for about nine years total actually adding all that up and so for those of you that are unfamiliar with the word catalyst it is basically a really cool molecule that allows a reaction to take the highway instead of the back roads so they get to take a shortcut and so it usually speeds up the reaction by giving them an alternate path so palladium palladium is the answer nice that might be my favorite too now <laughs> uh, <laughs> hmm Great questions, guys. Wonderful questions. Thank you for submitting them. I think Ms. Madera, thank you for submitting questions for your kids. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. I think we have time for one more. Okay. Lily asks, what was your favorite thing about chemistry? I think what I like about chemistry is that it explains everything that's going on around us. So everything that you see is based on chemistry. So the blue colors in here, that's chemistry. Um, the fact that we were able to use magnets and use iron oxide powder and slime, that's all chemistry. The polymerizations are chemistry. Um, hair, makeup, all that is chemistry. Jewelry, the metals, that's chemistry. Um, and then you can take that all the way out into the road. So you have cars, they use engines, they use a combustion engine, that's chemistry. The tires, the rubber, that's chemistry. How the car actually operates, if there's electronics, those are electrons and it's all chemistry. So for me, my favorite thing about it is that it can literally explain everything you can see. If you can see an object, there's chemistry in it. I promise you that. And that's what I think is one of the most amazing things about my field is I'm always surrounded by it. And if I have a question about how something works, I can usually use chemistry to figure out an answer. And I just love that. That is fantastic. Amazing answer. Thank you for answering all these questions. And thanks to everyone who submitted any questions. Uh, appreciate that so much. They were all fantastic, even if we didn't get to all of them. And thank you all for coming. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Have a great day, y'all. <laughs>